Jesus, the light of the world. And each week during Advent, we've been lighting a candle and having a reading remind us uh, about different aspects of Christ and, and what he brings to us with, with the hope, the, the, the peace, the love, and the joy that we experience this season. And so we have Julia and Ellis that are going to be um, reading our Advent reading for us today. So let's, let's listen to them. Isaiah said that the Lord spoke to the king and said, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But when the king refused, God would not be stopped. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God wants us to know, even when we think we aren't sure ourselves, God wants us to experience God's presence. Even when we think we can handle life on our own, God sends us signs of God's presence with us. All we need to do is keep our eyes open and look. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from, from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. We light these candles, the candles of joyous hope, of proclaimed peace, and of abiding love as a sign that no matter our circumstances, we know we are not alone. That's right. Thank you, guys. No matter our circumstances, we are not alone. Children, you can go ahead and make your way back. So, last week, Pastor Paul gave me the topic I'll be speaking to you about within the Advent series, and that's the topic of love. Now, I think Pastor Paul gave me this topic because he thought to himself, well, how could Paul screw this one up? <laughs> but like most every teacher I've ever had in school would say, Paul, you never cease to amaze me. So here we go. <laughs> you know, I, I do think about all of my poor teachers I've had over the years that, and if, if they ever would have dreamed, I've wondered if they've ever would have dreamed or thought in their wild, wildest imagination that I would be here one day standing behind this pulpit preaching to you, and I don't think any one of them would have taken that bet. <laughs> but here I am. And how did I get here? Well, I'm here because of the topic we're going to talk about today. I'm here because of God's love. And I'm assuming that you might feel the same way when I heard about this topic that I'm going to speak on. I was like, God's love. What more could be said about God's love? The reality is there's so many different directions you could head. But the one that kept drawing me back to the one that the Lord was really making me want to speak on was, it starts here, it's, it's asking myself, why is it here I am, a man who absolutely loves the Lord? Why is it that I'm a man who loves this church? Why is it I'm a man who loves God's word, who loves my four boys, but not only my four boys, but I love their friends and their classmates? Who do I attribute this transformation in my life to? And 1 John 4.19 sums it up well. It says, we love because he first loved us. So who do I attribute my transformed life to? Well, it didn't start with me. It started with God. I'm a miracle, but so are you. Every one of you here who has been born again. I want to start by drawing a simple diagram. It's a diagram that many will be familiar with. Students, the high school students, this will be like review, so try to stay awake. If you've been in a journey group, you're going to know exactly where I'm heading. But this diagram sums up two ways 
to relate to God. And I would say within these two ways as we talk about them this morning, I would say every religion falls into one of these categories. I'm going to draw this simple diagram just to give you a little visual to think about. And it starts with this. Let's start with God. I think if you believe in God, or if someone just as simple as that believes there's a God out there, most people would at least hope that this God would accept them especially when it comes to the last day when they stand before him on judgment day. So most people would hope for that. And there's two ways to relate to God. And the first way I want to talk about could be summed up in this word. Performance. Performance is the idea of doing certain things and not doing certain things in order to earn God's favor. And on this diagram, notice that I'm going to draw an arrow, but the arrow, the starting point, starts here with the individual. And the idea is this person is working their way, hopefully, to God in the end, who will accept them. And there's a word that can sum up this way of living, and the word is doing. In fact, you might even say you could describe this as the religion of doing. And if, to give you an example, you know, what kind of list might this be? Well, there would be thousands and maybe even millions of varieties of lists. Every religion has a list of things they say you need to do. And if we were to just make up our own list quickly, I mean, just to give you an example, it could be um, we should be kind Maybe we could add to our list, be honest. Well, let's put some do's and don'ts. Let's say, do not lie. Maybe do not cheat. And you see where we're heading here. Let's, let's do some others. Maybe we say, we think we should go to church. And look at you guys. Every one of you get to get that. Good job. Maybe we say, read the Bible. Maybe on our list we say we should pray. How many times? Just depends. But this is an example of a list, and there could be all kinds of them. And what's interesting about this type of relating to God through performance is it creates a righteousness. So I'm going to add that because there is a righteousness involved here. But it happens to be self-righteousness because it comes from, it flows from the individual and their determination and their commitment. And let me say, this way of relating to God repulses God. Absolutely repulses God. And you might be like thinking, what? Why would that repulse God? Because most people in our culture, maybe even you here would say, this looks like a great list. In fact, if you lived up to that list or even tried, you would be highly respected in our culture today. So how could God be upset or repulsed by someone living in such a way? Well, let me give you a story to maybe help you understand why this repulses God. Picture a husband and a wife, a happy couple, a normal couple. And think about this wife, goes to her husband and says, honey, I want you to just give me a day. I want a whole day to spend with you. And the wife has all kinds of ideas. She knows what she wants to do on this day. But she asks her husband, will you give me a day? And he agrees. And she says, that's great. Let's do it this Saturday. And she says, promise me you will protect Saturday. This is just for you and I. And so he promises. He goes to work that week, has a good week. It comes to Friday. He's close to checking out, going home. But he gets a phone call. 
And it's from one of his friends. And his friend is on the phone, and he is so excited. He's like, you won't believe it. We did it. We are accepted to play golf at Augusta. We've been wanting to do this for so long, and they accepted our request. And we have a tea time this Saturday at 1. Can you believe it? His friend on the other line could tell that he was a little bit hesitant. And he asked, is there a, is there a problem? What, what's the hesitation all about? And he goes, no hesitation. This is great. I'll be there. Click. He hangs up and he knows, oh boy, I'm in a situation. He drives home, but he's a smart guy. And instead of driving by the flower shop like he did for the last five years, he's actually going to go into it. And he buys his wife a beautiful bouquet of flowers. He gets back into his car, starts heading home, and he realizes, I'm not quite sure if that's enough. And so he stops at the jewelry store along the way, and he buys his wife a beautiful diamond necklace. That's it. He heads home, goes through the doors, and presents these gifts to his wife. At first, she's a little suspicious, because she, he's never done that before. What's the occasion? Oh, honey, there's no occasion. I just want to show you my love. She is floored, loves them. It's a couple hours within the evening, and he's got to figure out when he's going to drop the bomb, and he finds that it's like time to do it. He shares with her this whole call from his friend, and the moment he brings up golf, she knows exactly where he's heading, and she just sees it. And she walks over to the flowers, grabs them out of the vase, and throws them on the floor. And she takes her necklace and rips it off her neck and throws it at her, at her husband. And she screams, you repulse me. Now, time out. What happened? Did this wife suddenly stop loving flowers? Did she suddenly stop Loving diamond necklaces. Of course not. What she's discovered was his true motives behind the gifts. And in a similar way, God is repulsed when we give him gifts with wrong motives. Performance is doing the things God loves with wrong motives. And this is a way of relating to God that the culture that we live in is most used to and most comfortable with. However, it repulses God. And I want to tell you a story from the scriptures. And this is going to be our focus passage for today. This comes from John 3. So turn with me in your Bibles to John chapter 3. Nicodemus is going to be the man that we meet He's going to have an encounter with Jesus, and Nicodemus is a clear and powerful illustration of someone trying to earn heaven by being a good person. We're going to read this passage. I'm going to explain as many parts to it as I can. I won't be able to go through every, every detail, but I want and hope and pray that God's word just speaks for itself. Let's read it together. God's word says, starting in verse 1, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear it sound. But you do not know where it comes from or where it, or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus said, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel and yet you do not understand these things? So 
looking at this verse by verse. Verse 1 says, now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus. And I can't get past this first little word. And this is a connector word. This is a powerful word. This word is begging us. It's drawing us, calling us to go backwards. To go back and understand the context that this encounter that Jesus has with Nicodemus is setting in. Unless we don't do this, we may read the story and, and draw a wrong conclusion. So let's go back and just understand what's happened so far. And this is what's happened so far in the book of John. So far, verse 23 says, Now when there was a man in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw that the signs that he was doing. We'll pause there. This, these two verses here, serve as an introduction to Jesus' encounter with Nicodemus. We're at Passover week. So far, this is what's happened. Jesus has performed one of his greatest miracles to the date, and that is he turned water into wine at the wedding of Cana of Galilee. And he's also went to the temple and he's cleaned house. He made quite a statement, and people took notice. It says many observed the signs that he was doing, and it says many believed, and Nicodemus was a part of that group who believed. Now, if you stopped right here, you would assume and say to yourself, like me, I think, this is great, especially if you take into consideration the purpose of the book of John. He states it at the end of John, John chapter 20, verse 31. He says, the reason for the book of John is this. He wrote these things that, so that many would believe in Jesus, the Son of God, and that by believing in his name, you'll have life. So I am assuming at this moment, the fact that there is many believing in Jesus is a great thing. But read on. When Jesus, on his part did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in all people and he needed no one to bear witness about man for he himself knew what was in man. This is shocking. Can you believe this is what Jesus said? I'll put it in my own words. Many believed in Jesus but Jesus didn't believe in their belief. Many put their faith in Jesus but Jesus didn't have faith in their faith. And the reason is because Jesus can see past the confession and he sees into the soul and understands the motives behind the confession. This is showing that Jesus is divine omniscience. He can see the heart, knows the mind. And we're going to see this demonstrated in the story about Nicodemus. Back to our text. We're still in verse one, and there's this man, Nicodemus, and what do we learn about this man? Well, the text tells us a few things. He says, the text tells us he's a Pharisee. It also says he's a ruler of the Jews, and he's a, the teacher of Israel. A little bit about each. One is a Pharisee. There's so many things you could say, but a Pharisee was a part of a religious group. At this point of Jesus' life, there was roughly 6,000 Pharisees. This was an elite group of men committed to following every command in the scriptures. They were hyper-religious. They were experts in the Old Testament, teachers serious about obeying every law, all 613 of them, all 248 do's and 365 don'ts. This was the kind of man Nicodemus was. He was also a ruler of the Jews, which means he was a part of the Sanhedrin, which is an even more elite group of people. This is only made up of 70 men. It's kind of like the Supreme Court of Israel, and Nicodemus is in that club. And he says he's also the teacher of Israel, not just a teacher. He was the teacher of Israel. This is quite impressive. His credentials, wow. This man is at the top of the theological pyramid. If you put it in my words, this man is a religious pro. But not just a religious pro, he's on the all-star team voted MVP. This man is something else. And it's him who comes to Jesus. It says, verse two, this man came to Jesus by night and he said some things and I get stuck with this. Why did, G why did Nicodemus come to Jesus 
at night, and I think it's quite obvious, there was a lot at stake for Nicodemus to be seen talking to this man named Jesus. And he goes on, and this is what he said. He said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher that has come from God, and we know that you can do these signs, that no one can do these signs unless God is with him. This tells us a little bit about what Nicodemus believed. Nicodemus believed that Jesus was a teacher and a prophet that had come from God. And this is pretty remarkable when you take into consideration that he believed these things, especially when you think about the rest of the Pharisees who looked at Jesus and came to a different conclusion. The other Pharisees concluded that this Jesus guy was from hell and that he received his powers to do the signs that he did from Satan. Well, I would say Nicodemus seems to be heading in the right direction. He's not all the way there, though. Verse 3, Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And we go from Nicodemus' confession to this. This, is, this should just make your head spin when you read it. It says, Jesus answered him. What? What did Jesus answer? Nicodemus did not ask a question. What is he answering? And he's answering this. He's answering the question that is in Nicodemus' mind. And he's addressing the worry and fear that he sees in his heart. God is demonstrating, I should say, Jesus, who is God, is demonstrating his divine omniscience. He knows what's in the heart of man. He doesn't just see Nicodemus' out well and we're very impressed. But Jesus saw into his soul. He knew his mind and he knew his heart. And I think, you know, why out of all the people, all of the Jews, why would Nicodemus be one who would be fearful? I mean, there's no one better than this guy. Nicodemus, he tried to follow every law. He was the kind of guy that crossed every T and dotted every I. But in his heart, he even knew. He wasn't sure, was it enough? And there was fear and worry. And Jesus saw it, and he went straight after it. Jesus said, truly, truly, and goes on to say some things. And it's worth noting, you'll notice if you read the book of John, this phrase, it comes 25 times in this book. And every time you read it, you should say, you should realize what it's saying. It's, this is an emphatic statement. This is a strong statement. Jesus is saying, in a sense, listen up, something new. I'm going to tell you something new. Sit up, listen up. Nicodemus, he's lived his entire life assuming that his religious credentials, his Jewish lineage, and his good works would guarantee him a place in the kingdom. But Jesus is saying, brace yourself, Nicodemus. Listen up. There's something new you need to hear. And this is what he needed to hear. Unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. So what does this mean? What does it mean to be born again? I've heard all kinds of wacky explanations on this one. And, but Jesus said, it's simple. I'm using, Jesus used an earthly illustration to communicate a heavenly reality. Let me tell you how simple this analogy is by tell, asking you two questions. Think about it. What role did you play in your birth, your physical birth? What contribution did you make to your physical birth? The answer is obvious, isn't it? I mean, to assume that you had anything to do with your physical birth is an insane idea. And equally so, for you, Nicodemus, for you and I to think that we had anything to do with our spiritual birth is equally insane. And that's why Jesus is using this analogy, because it's so clear. To be born again is a work in which you play no role in. Your birth happened to you. And such is true for our spiritual birth. It's a work of God. 
Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you think salvation starts? You think salvation starts with you? It doesn't start with you. It starts with me. See, a Pharisee, a Pharisee lived for the resurrection. A Pharisee, he lived for the afterlife. I mean, no one would live such a restricted life if they didn't think what they were giving up today was going to benefit them someday in the future. Pharisees, Nicodemus was living for the future. He was achieving, earning heaven by his law keeping and and self-righteousness. And here Jesus is saying, it's all for nothing. He was saying, your religion and all of it combined together is useless. It does remind me of Isaiah 64, 6, which says, all of your righteous works are like filthy rags in God's sight. Jesus' point is unmistakably clear. To be a part of the kingdom, you must be a born again, and that's not something you play a part in. It's a 100% work of God. Verse four. Nicodemus, is, he said to him, how? How can this be? I, I really believe Nicodemus is, is absolutely in shock. This is, Jesus is, is far from, uh, from offering Nicodemus this easy believism message. Jesus was challenging Nicodemus with the most difficult demand he could have made. See, Nicodemus would have been glad if Jesus would have said, what you need to do is give more. Nicodemus would have given more. If Jesus would have told Nicodemus, you know, you need to fast or perform these rituals in addition to what you're doing, he would have done it. I'm confident of that. Whatever Jesus would have prescribed, Nicodemus was the kind of man he would get the job done. But that's not the message. Jesus was calling for something different. He was calling Nicodemus to surrender. He was calling Nicodemus to acknowledge his insufficiency, his sin, to stop trusting in his works and to start trusting in the work and the finished work of Christ, which Jesus was coming to do, to die on the cross. Nicodemus, I just jumped if you noticed, all the way to the end, verse nine. I don't have the time to go through every verse like I wish I could. Nicodemus said to him at the end of this encounter, he said, how can these things be? See, Nicodemus couldn't believe it, what he was hearing. How could he, I think in his mind, how can he, how can Jesus say everything I've done is useless? He's, I've worked my whole life to get the kingdom and now you're telling me I'm not accepted, I'm not in? How could I've missed this? To start over? You're, calling, you're asking me to start over? How can I start over when I've gone this far? Jesus' last words said, are you the teacher of Israel and you don't understand these things? And this is the last rebuke that silenced Nicodemus. We don't hear from him any further. Nicodemus, at this point of his life, was relying on himself and his good works to earn heaven, and he had a lot of them. He had a lot of righteousness, but it happened to be of the self-righteous kind, the kind that repulses God. He was doing the things God loved, but with wrong motives. So I want to build this diagram and continue because I said there's two approaches to relating to God. We talked about the first, which God hates. But as much as he hates the first, he loves the second. He loves this approach. And let me build this part. I'm not talking about performance anymore. This is something different. And a good word to sum up this is the word grace. And as you think about the starting point, the first way to relate to God starts with the individual, but not with the second. The second starts with God. And notice I'm going to draw the arrow from God to grace, which reminds us of Jesus' work on the cross. 
And there's a word we used over here, doing, but this is different because the best word to maybe sum up this way of relating to God is the word done. On the cross, when Jesus was, um, said his last statement, he said, it is finished. The debt has been paid. See, he had done what he set out to do, which was pay for the penalties of those sins who put their trust in him. And here's what's interesting, is there is a righteousness that is also a part of this way of relating, relating to God. But it's not of the self-righteous kind. It's Christ's righteousness. I want to read a passage in 2 Corinthians 5.21. This, I think, sums up the gospel message, which is what I think this is really all about. It says, he made him who knew no sin to be sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Some people call this passage the great swap or the great exchange. And if I put put it into my words, quite simply, it's this. What we have, what Nicodemus had, and I would include ourselves. What we have, God hates. And what Jesus has, we need. What we have, sin, God hates because he's a holy God. What we need is what Jesus has, and that's righteousness. On the cross, talking about love, Advent, love came from heaven to earth. And he came and to go, went from the manger to the cross. And on the cross, what Jesus did was he's offered to, to take your sins. He's willing to take them. And he's willing to take and pay the penalty and price for them, which is death, his life's blood. But the exchange isn't complete. It doesn't stop there because he's willing to take your sins And Jesus is willing to give you his righteousness. An amazing swap. An amazing exchange. There's another verse I wanted to read. Oops, wrong button. It's this. It's 2 Corinthians. Actually, it's Ephesians 2, 8, 9. It says this, a common verse. Maybe you've heard it. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It's a gift of God not a result of work, so that no one may boast. See, faith is saying to God, I give up. It's surrender. Faith says to God, I can never make myself right before you, so I trust and depend on you completely for what I can't do myself. Faith is the anti-work. Faith is the acknowledgement there is nothing you can do except trust in what Christ has done for you. Faith is the one attitude of the heart that's the exact opposite of depending on yourself. And so this is incredible because not only does Christ offer to take and pay for your sins, and not, all, not only does he is he willing to offer you his righteousness, but he also, in this exchange and in this miracle of rebirth, he's also willing to give you a new heart and to fill it with love and to fill it with new desires. There's a passage in Romans 5, Romans 5, 5. It says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into us and into our hearts through the Holy Spirit whom he has given to us. And so here it is. We finally got there. I was supposed to talk about love. I got the box, Pastor Paul. We did it. Yes. And so what's amazing about this way of relating to God is it starts with God. And through Christ, there's this amazing gift and grace of what Christ has done. And grace produces love. And love compels performance. There's a verse, and it goes on. I think my last verse, I believe. 
2 Corinthians 5, 14 through 14. Thank you. For the love of Christ, it says, controls us, compels us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, and therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. This love that Paul is talking about in this passage is not describing Paul's love for Jesus. He's describing Jesus' love for Paul. It blows him out of the water. It compels his heart. He's amazed. The gospel has filled Paul's heart. He's filled my heart. He's filled every man and woman's heart who has been born again with this amazing love. And what's this love compel us to do? It compels us to do the things God loves, but this time with right motives. It's a conclusion. Why do I love God? Why do I love the church? Why do I love his word? Why do I love my boys? Not only my boys, why do I love their friends and their classmates? It's all owing to God. We love because he first loved us. And who do I attribute my transformed life to? It didn't start with me. It started with God. And here's the question I want to ask you. Is where is your starting point? Is your starting point here, as I've described it, as you've listened to God's word, as you've looked at Nicodemus' example, and, it, and if you are here thinking to yourself, my goodness, this really describes me. I've been trying to earn God's favor by doing these things. And you're realizing, maybe even for the first time, that it's all in vain in God's sight. If this is your starting point, I plead with you to consider changing from here and going here. And here's gonna, this is going to baffle you for a moment. I'm now challenging you to follow Nicodemus' example. Because Nicodemus actually, at the end of this passage in John 3, we're left with a cliffhanger. We don't hear from him again. But he comes back into the gospel story at the end of the book where we see Nicodemus helping bury Jesus' body. Nicodemus, somewhere between chapter 3 and the end of the book, heeded God's word, heeded Jesus' voice, and responded and, and transferred his trust from himself to the Savior. Nicodemus surrendered. He stopped trusting himself and began trusting in Christ and what he has done. My question to you is, where is your starting point? Let's pray. Lord, we have the promise that whoever comes to you will never be turned away. Jesus, you said, I've come to call the, not to call the righteous, but to call sinners to repentance. And those promptings to come to you are promptings that you initiate. So where those desires rise in the heart today, it's your spirit at work. Lord, I pray that you would bring people today, this morning, into your kingdom. Give them life from above. May they believe in you, Jesus, the Holy One, and in believing, have eternal life. Amen. If you're here and you're thinking to yourself, it's too late. I've gone way too far. For me to change, how? I beg you to remember, I bet Nicodemus thought the same things. Advent is a season of anticipating God sending his son to us. Let us never lose our amazement and the wonder of this amazing gift in the person of Christ. Have a great week in the Lord. You're dismissed.